So I'm going to talk about uh, what I've been doing for 30 odd years, which is producing the global temperature record. And because we had some new and a new data set out last week, I thought it would be topical. And I'll then I'll look about look then on to future impacts across the UK. And this will extend on what Bob was talking about about these UK <coughs> projections 2009. So first bit of feedback was updated versions and Part of the result of this work was to uh, try and ensure that we could release all the data and all the software so that we didn't get people harassing us with uh, FOI um, requests about the data and about the, the programs, etc. So this work is joint work we do at uh, U the University of East Anglia in Norwich with the Met Office, and I'll probably refer to them as the Hagley Centre. Um, the Hadley Centre was their research, climate research arm that they set up. Uh, and I was on the Hadley Centre review panel for a number of years. And one of the things we were doing as a review panel a lot of the time was to try and stop the Met Office subsuming it and, and losing the Hadley Centre brand. And so we end up with this, this uh, phrase, Met Office Hadley Centre, to try and keep their research arm because they were worried that the Hadley Centre was more important than the Met Office. I'll talk about the improvements to our land data. Uh, which we have called Crew Temp 4, and then the marine data, the, which is what the Met, the Met Office do, and this is sea surface temperature data around the world, and then how they're combined. Um, so this new data, data set is just out. I'll then move on to some changes in the uh, uh, ice parts of the world, and then look at recent changes across the UK in temperature and rainfall, and then how we go about assessing impacts with these projections that Bob was talking about. Um, what we've done with this new data set is we've improved the coverage of, of data across the world. So what we do is we divide the world up into five degree latitude longitude grid boxes. And the, the two American groups that do this uh, do spatial infilling. So if a box has no stations in, they will interpolate it from the neighboring ones. Now you get, you've got, with a latitude longitude grid box uh, network, you've got more boxes towards the polar regions and less in the equatorial. So they, they did a lot of spatial infilling. So what we've done is to try and get access to more data. And um, we've got greater numbers of stations now in Russia and Canada. Now this, these weren't available about five, five or ten years ago. So um, it's quite important to get these. And this has resulted from digitization efforts, particularly in Canada, and, um, and Russia just making more data available. They had it all digitized when it was the Soviet Union. So getting more stations means you have more grid boxes filled. And you, we're still not doing any spatial interpolation, so there's still gaps. And the big gaps are over the Antarctic, because there's only relatively few stations there. Um, and what the Met Office have done is to look at how we've, how we've measured sea surface temperature over the last 150 years. So I'll refer to that as SST data. And it's, awful. So it's a lot of discussion about adjustments we make to the land data and to the marine data. And I'll briefly allude to some of those. And people was, some of the skeptics will say, why do you make these adjustments? Why can't we just measure, use the temperature as, as measured? Um, but with the marine data, uh, how we measured temperatures in the past was quite different from how we measure it today, and I'll come to that a bit, a bit later. And one of the big problems we noticed in more recent times was that in this period just after the Second World War, oops, uh, sort of 46 to 60, uh, it turns out that up, up till about 1940, we all nations who were maritime nations measured temperature at sea using buckets. There were different types of buckets. Obviously, on the sailing ships, there were wooden buckets. And as they became merchant ships and uh, steamships, they became uh, canvas buckets. And so canvas buckets were, had a big problem because the water in them cooled slightly, and so you had to adjust the temperatures. Um, and now we're getting a lot of other, other problems. I can't get this thing to oh, can work now. We're measuring sea surface temperature a lot better now because we're using fixed and drifting buoys. And these are put out every, every few months by uh, major 
shipping fleets and also by research vessels because they don't last very long. The fixed ones are in the tropical Pacific and they are, they are set. And they, they last a bit longer. They last about 10 years. Drifting ones only last about a year. I'll show you some examples of them later. But there's a whole new set of, of modifications to those in this new set of data that the Hadley Centre has produced. Now, if we didn't do those, those adjustments to the marine data, principally for this change from buckets to engine intakes or hull sensors and these drifting buoys, then there would be a lot, the temperature would be a lot, the change would be a lot greater because the buckets are about somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5 degrees Celsius cooler than the ships and the measurements after World War II. And the other thing that the skeptics all get wrong is that if you have an average temperature and with a fixed base period like 1961 to 90, the sea temperature and the land temperatures can't really differ that much as a global average. And so if you didn't make these adjustments, you would have great differences in the, in the, in the sea and air temperatures that just couldn't happen naturally. Anyway, to cut a long story short, this is the land temperatures. Um, so you've got 1850 here to the 2010. And all the graphs I'm going to show, zero is the average for the period 1961 to 90. So those 30 years are the period of best coverage. And the average of those 30 years is zero. So every year is then expressed as a departure from that 30-year average. Um, and these are the individual years. The sort of histogram part in the smooth line is a sort of data adaptive filter at about a decadal time scale. The solid line is the new version, and the thin line is the old version. And you can see, apart from these few years at the end, uh, these years here in the 19th century, there's virtually no difference between these two data sets. In other words, adding all this extra data in Russia and Canada has made hardly any difference. Adding it has made it slightly warmer in recent, the recent 10 years, simply because the Arctic has been a lot warmer than other parts of the world. And adding it here, particularly in Russia, has made it cooler, because those areas in Russia were cooler in those years in the, in the 19th century. In terms of spatial patterns now, so this is the period 2001 to 10. This is the coverage we had in these five degree latitude longitude boxes. Um, and you can see the gaps here in Africa and the, the sort of dotty nature in sort of northern Russia and northern Canada in the old version. And this is the new one now with the extra data. So you've got fewer gaps. You've still got the gaps in Africa because we just can't get access to some of the data, uh, partly because of wars and uh, just the lack of infrastructure in some of the countries to produce the series. Um, there is a sort of capacity building exercise that some countries are less keen to release their data. They don't want to just be seen as data collection agencies for, for sort of Western scientists to work with. Um, in terms of the difference, you see there's very small differences. This, these sort of squares here are where the new boxes are. So you can see they're mostly in the northern high latitudes. There are more differences over in the US and Australia, that's because we've, they've been doing a lot more work over the last few years on the quality of their data, and we've made use of their extra data they've now provided for the contiguous US and for Australia. So that's the slight differences there. This is another way of doing it, Look, looking at the trend from 1951 to 2000. This is the old data set. This is the new one. You can see the improved coverage again. Um, and this is really just better real-time access to data in, in now, rather than, in, say, 10 years ago, you didn't have this sort of access to, to stations. Um, but from early work we'd we, we, we done years ago, you could, have sh you could have said this was going to happen. So what, this what I'm showing you here is you've got 1850 to 2010 here again. Then... You've got it on different, uh, this is the northern hemisphere, this is the southern hemisphere. These are the various seasons, the four seasons, winter, spring, summer, autumn, and this is the annual. This is the southern hemisphere. 
Um, so what we've done here is we've got about five and a half thousand stations. We've then separated them into five groups, just simply by taking the first station, the sixth station, the eleventh station, and so on, and then you take the second, seventh, twelfth, and so on. You get twenty, you get twenty percent in each, and they're completely different stations. And if you average them all together in the same way, you produce these different coloured curves here. So you can see, until you get into the 20th century, it makes, it makes a bit of difference in the, in the late 19th. Um, but after about 1900, there's very little difference. You've got this right up in temperature to the about 1940, somewhat of a cooling off. This is just land at the moment, and then a rise up in recent times. Southern Hemisphere, because there's less land, and there's big problems with data availability and access, not access, but just not collected in parts of South America and Antarctica as well. So there's bigger error ranges, which is what these green line, green swathes mean. So if you took just 20% of the data, you could produce the same result. And you can do this with 10%, even 5% works. If you already wanted was the global average. If you want the patterns, then you need to use a lot more stations. So in effect, what you can also do is to take a network of stations that you know are entirely rural and produce the same result. And the same argument shows you that there's, there's no real urban effect on large scales. There might be urban effects locally, but they're not pervasive to affect the whole data set because you can pre-select just rural-only stations. Another way of doing this... Uh, particularly to address concerns in, a, in, the, in the US, um, is that we then did the same sort of thing, and you can look at the bottom here. This is the Northern Hemisphere Annual, and there's a thin line there, which you can't see, because it's under the solid one most of the time. You can just see it coming out here in the winter in the 19th century. Um, is the average for the Northern Hemisphere, for all land, excluding the, the United States, so just the 48 lower US states. So you take out the whole of the US and you get the same trend in temperature. Ups and downs, decadal, century scale trends are exactly the same. So you can take out large countries. We did this finally taking out the former Soviet Union and then you do begin to see a little bit of an effect. But taking out the contiguous US, you see very little effect. What you also see in this figure in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, is you see characteristic things about our, our, our climate. This is the winter months, December, January, February. There's a lot of variability from year to year, um, from winter to winter. But from summer to summer, there's a lot less. So in summer, there are, this means that you have areas of warmer and colder than normal. There'll be a lot of a lot of areas warmer, a lot of areas cooler. Whereas in winter, you tend to have very few areas warmer and very few areas colder. In other words, the temperatures we get are controlled in winter by the circulation where the wind is blowing from. Whereas in summer, it's controlled almost entirely by where the cloud is. And so you have smaller areas. I mean, there are issues. If you look at these closely, you'll see that the 19th century is cold. Oops. In winter, it's cold in spring, it's cold in autumn. But in summer, it's slightly warmer. And this is still a problem, we think, with the data in the middle of the 19th century due to the change in how we measure temperature. So now you see thermometers located in little white louvered screens. Prior to about 1860, those didn't exist, and you had, them, you had the thermometers located on north wall locations. And they get affected by the direct sunlight because of the day length in summer. So we're still working on these issues in the middle of the 19th century. This is the same plot on the right now, but it's the northern hemisphere, it's, it's southern hemisphere, sorry. And taking out a country that's much bigger in terms of area, which is Australia. Now, when you take out Australia, you're taking out half the data for the southern hemisphere. And yet you can still barely see the without Australia line under, the, under this. You can see it in the 19th century, but during the 20th, you can hardly see it at all. So you can take out large countries and still get this. It's a very robust series. 
And trying to knock this, this data is just absolutely ridiculous. In fact, it's just so robust. Um, then this is just comparisons with our, our American colleagues doing work. Um, their series is in red and green here. And they're virtually overlapping, getting almost exactly the same trends from when, whenever you calculate them with these two series from the Northern Hemisphere. And the error ranges from the Northern Hemisphere come down to very small values by the time you get to 1950. Southern Hemisphere has these much bigger error ranges. That's because of the lack of coverage, principally in the Antarctic. <coughs> but there are large areas of South America, even parts of Australia, where there's, where there's no data. It's because there's no people. Um, one other thing now, before we get on to the marine data. Um, this is a comparison with something called reanalysis. Um, and this is, all, this is a recent one done by the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, which is about 10 miles away in, in Reading. And what this is, is it's, it's producing a, a weather forecast every day. They produce weather forecasts out of 15 days. We don't get to see them here because we see the Met Office ones. But they're done for other countries in, in, in Europe. Um, and over the last 50 years, these have um, improved as computers have improved. Our models of the atmosphere have improved, and the data input has improved because we're now getting a lot of satellite data in. So what they've done, gone, gone and done is to, is to go back and rerun these models with the same a fixed computer system and relatively fixed data input. And if you do that, then you're not using any temperature data here. You're just using the satellite estimates of the, um, uh, the radiances that the satellites measure different levels in the atmosphere. You're using sea surface temperatures, but you're not using the land temperatures. Um, you're using the pressure data that all is measured as well. And they produce this blue series here, which goes up and down almost in direct agreement with our land temperatures. This is over the land areas. And their trend is slightly more than ours over this last 30 years. And this slight in slightly larger trend of their series is probably due the fact that we haven't got complete coverage everywhere. So if we did have more stations in, in some parts of Russia and Canada and a few other parts, we probably would get a slightly warmer uh, trend. So if anything, we're underestimating the trend very slightly. That's the same thing for the Southern Hemisphere. Um, you can't do this over the Antarctic because all the, the reanalysis is, is, is in error there and for known reasons. Um, they're doing their best to try and solve. But again, you get these very similar trends in terms of the warming and the agreement on the year-to-year -year time scale. This is just down to 60 degrees south from the equator. Now, I mentioned earlier about the sea surface temperatures. The big problem is that there's this changeover from engine intake measurements to, uh, to engine from buckets. There's countries and, and Shipping fleets did this at different times. Um, so the Americans did it first. Uh, we didn't really do it until 1960. We still had people on the sides of ships throwing buckets over. Even though uh, during the Second World War we had a lot of American ships, we still didn't use the, the ability to use their engine intake measurements. The buckets design varied and lots of other issues. Um, then, then there's still issues. There's issues now. The sea surface temperature data from ships comes in with the call sign of the ship and the location and the data. A lot of shipping fleets now are reluctant to make this data available. This is for security reasons, because some of them feel that they don't want them, love them to know if they're just off Somalia, for example. There's trade and economic reasons. So a lot of fishing fleet data from Japan, Taiwan, and uh, South Korea isn't known until about two years after the, afterwards. It comes in much later, because they don't want to know where they are fishing. So we could improve the data a bit. Um, then, I meant, then I'll show you a bit about these uh, other more improved methods uh, in a few minutes. Um, just to point out that sea surface temperature, um, if we didn't make these adjustments, it would have, the world would have warmed more. 
And, but SSTs are vital to many other areas of atmospheric sciences. They are vital for weather forecasts, and that's why they need to have all this data in. And so in going back and trying to understand how the measurements have been taken over the last 100, 150 years, um, you have to go back and start looking at books to find out what they, because it wasn't noted down how they were taken, it's just, just, just the number as a degree uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit number, you've got to go back and find out what the instructions were to the, the mariners, to how, how, to how they did this. And it's quite, it's quite difficult. If you could, uh, and one thing that is happening slowly is that there's a lot of logbooks taken by ships, these are sailing ships back to Captain Cook's time, and they are now being digitized. We've had a European projects where we digitized all the Spanish fleet, the Dutch fleet, the French fleet, and most of the American stuff has been digitized, but we've digitized about 10% of the British ships. So there's still masses and masses of logbooks across this country which need digitizing. We're even finding British logbooks in Chile, in Argentina, and a few other countries. So, and there was, if you go back about 1820, 1830, every ship on the ocean was British. So we did rule the waves then. Okay. Um, just to give you some idea now, this is sort of in percentage from 1900 to the present. These are where the buckets were, and these are where the engine intake measurements, and these are the, the drifters coming in in more recent times. So if you don't make adjustments for these, you will make uh, mistakes with the sea surface temperature data and this is really crucial to weather forecasting as well. It's just not done for climate purposes only. So these are what the ship's like now. These are what the drifters look like. So they're, they're put out by ships, and they send their, their data back by, uh, by satellites to ground stations, and then it gets used in, in, in weather forecasts. You've got the air temperature being measured here and the sea temperature down here, and they're measuring the pressure as well. And this just is an example of where we, of our observations. Um, this is in May 2010. The blue dots are the ships, and the red dots are the buoys. And you can see this is roughly how much they drift in a month. And there's some gray ones in here with the fixed ones, which are to measure sea temperatures in the tropical Pacific. And this gives us the forecast of El Nino events and La Nina events. And if you measure the sea temperatures very well there, you can perhaps give a bit of lead time as to when the next El Nino event will occur or when the next La Nina event will occur. Gives you a, a sort of an extra six months possibility in the forecasting potential. And because those phenomena have a big impact on the tropics uh, and much of the Pacific Basin, it's really important to do this work. And that's the same month again, and this is now the temperature. They're coded by temperature now, so whether they're the, the oranges and reds are whether they're warmer than normal, and the blues are whether they're cooler than normal. And so the Met Office did all this work, and they go from that to, to this. So infilling all the, 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 the world's oceans with uh, uh, sea temperature values. <coughs> a, lot of, a lot of issues with this. Um, you can see here you're getting some temperatures in, in the Arctic. And because you're using a 1961 to 19 average period, you've got areas where you haven't got this, this data in the earlier period. So it's very, there's a lot of, there's some assumptions made as to how you get these temperatures near to the sea ice limits. But the sea ice limits are changing. It's very crucial to, to actually get those. But the real problem is, is, is this diagram here. So this is since the drift has started. And they're recording temperatures. This is all based on a ship-based normal, which is the 61 to 90 base period. So the drifters are about somewhere about one-tenth of a degree to two-tenths of a degree Celsius cooler than the ships. And as you get more and more of the drifters, so you actually pull the curve down slightly. And this is part of the reason that temperatures haven't warmed quite so much in the last 10 years in the data is because they haven't fully taken into account this dramatic changeover from about from no drifters to about 80% <coughs> drifters providing the data. So this is, this is what's all adjusted for in this new data set. 
And uh, this is just a diagram to show if you didn't make those adjustments, then uh, you would get the red line here. And if you do make those adjustments, you get the black line. This is the, the globe, southern northern hemisphere, the North Atlantic, and the South Pacific. So you've got to make these, these adjustments. And if people say, why can't we just have the raw numbers? Then the raw numbers would just be useless before the, particularly before the Second World War. Um, I won't uh, go on about this too much and I'll get on to the next part of the talk, but this is discussed in a number of uh, papers recently. <coughs> now, I just wanted this other point now, the sort of recent, recent trends. So, um, you come back here to this one. So this is this new data set, Crew T4, which is the combined land and ocean data set. And then this is also done by these two American groups uh, in green here and in, in, in red. And the Japanese also do this as well, and the Russians do it as well. So when people say there's just two other groups doing it, they're not allowing for the, for the Russians and Japanese either. Uh, and in terms of the trends, these data sets all, rel all agree within error ranges. So these are the trends of these four data sets over the last 100 years and over the last 50 years. They're all showing pretty much the same uh, trend of temperature. Now, you notice on these uh, plots, there are years which are much warmer than normal and years which are much cooler than normal. So you've got a lot of variability on the year-to-year -year time scale. And one of the ways of looking at that is to try and explain that and then take that out. So the big factor that influences these, these temperatures on the year-to-year -year time scale is whether you have an El Nino event or a La Nina event. Now, uh, 1998 was, uh, occurred at the end of the biggest El Nino event of the 20th century, which was 97-98. This is the big change in the circulation in the, in the Pacific. So during an El Nino event, the warm water that's generally off Indonesia and in the Central Pacific moves to the coast of Peru and Ecuador, leads to big floods in, in, in those parts, and makes South America very wet during, the, during an El Nino year. On the western side of the Pacific, the area of Australia and Indonesia becomes very, very dry. I mean, really big impacts on the rainfall in the tropical Pacific islands, influenced by this. It has impacts on southern Africa and impacts in southern Asia and eastern Asia and in parts of North America. Virtually the only continent that isn't affected by El Nino events in a big way is, is, is Europe, which is a big pity because Europe has the longest records. Um, the other things that influence this on the year-to-year -year timescale, well, you've got big volcanoes as well. So after Mount Pinatubo in 1991, there was a couple of cool summers following that. So one of the ways of looking at this is you can try and take out the impacts of El Nino and La Nina events from the record. And this just shows you when you have these big El Nino events, they're the red numbers. So they make the years warm. They're all warmer than normal years. The La Nina is the opposite phase, which when Australia gets very, very wet, Indonesia's wet, and South America is quite dry, and Southern Africa is quite dry. Um, they're the blue numbers here. So what this is telling you is that these events, these El Nino and La Nina events, are going on, regardless of the state of the climate system, whether it's a, a warm period or a cool period. You will get these. And some of the years recently, we've had a lot of, of La Nina events, apart from 2010. We've had one in 2008 and one in 2011 here. And these have been sort of record high temperatures for La Nina events. <coughs> so back in the 1960s, they were markedly cooler. And so what someone has done then is to look at the last 30 years and take different data sets and take out the effects of El Nino events, which is what they <coughs> Take out the effects of volcanoes and take out the small effect from the sun. So the solar output is our biggest contributor if, in terms of energy 
but it doesn't vary that much from, from year to year. There's a slight 11-year solar cycle between maxima and minima. So you can take out this in a sort of linear regressive type way, and you can show that the temperature record would look like this if you took out all those influences from these various different records. You can see that if you just looked at that period, that period you would see strong warming. And even over the last 10 years, you would see strong warming. So a lot of the discussion about whether the world's been warming over the last 10 years is simply a function of having this big El Nino event in 98, and then relatively smaller ones more recently, and also a large a number of, of, of La Nina events uh, more recently, and this only one El Nino event in 2010. So if you take out these influences, then you will get more of a, of a sort of linear trend and sort of what looks like sort of war, warming and warming and warming. And I, I did this about 15 years ago in a paper and got slammed by virtually every other climate scientist for doing this, for taking out something um, that people said was part of the climate system, you should leave it in. And now people are doing it to trying to show why we've not had so much warming in recent times. It's just because of the phase of the El Nino, La Nina cycle at the moment. Now, I said earlier that warming was not due to uh, urban heat outages. And there's a number of studies that have shown this. Um, there's a recent one done by the group you might have read about, the Berkeley Earth Surf Temperature Data Set. This is where they've got 30,000 stations around the world. And then, again, separated out the urban stations from the rural stations and showed that there was no difference in the trends over the land areas for the, uh, for the urban stations compared to the rural ones. There are other papers that have done this, but still there's a lot of the skeptics keep on going on about urban heat islands are the cause for this. Um, I just want to show you something now for central London, which is warmer, uh, but no, it's no more warmer in central London than since, than, than since 1900. And this is a uh, time series for London. This is from 1880 to about 2010. So here you've got the daytime temperatures here, the average temperatures and the nighttime temperatures. And I want you to look at two, a couple of curves here. Look at the orange one, which is St. James's Park. There's a small observatory in St. James's Park, just on the park side of the uh, Horse Guards Parade end of the park. And that's produced temperatures since 1900, roughly. And they're the orange line. And this is the sort of decadal average of those. It comes along and starts going up in the last 30, 40 years. The two green lines are Rotham State Agricultural Station, which is in near Harpenden in, in Bedfordshire, and Wisley Tampa Gardens. They come along here. They're cooler. Uh, Rotham State's about 100 meters high, so it's, it's got an elevation effect too. But in terms of the trend and the, the ups and downs, these two rural stations, uh, southwest and northwest of London, are not warming any more than central London itself. Um, so there's really uh, no real extra urban heat island in London since 1900. It may be that London has just been there for such a long time that the temperatures have got warmer by about a degree Celsius prior to 1900. And this might be a factor in some Chinese cities, but they've been there a long time. But some of the American cities have been there very short times, and they may have more of this effect. But in terms of London and a lot of other big cities in Europe, which we've looked at, um, then urban, urban heat islands are not really a big problem. They may be a big problem on a few days when the weather's right, but on the majority of days over the year, then they're not. One thing you can see here is that if you look at the daytime temperatures, then all these places have roughly the same sort of daytime temperatures, whereas at night, you still see a much wider range because central London stays warmer into the night than the rural sites do. So there's greater spread here. Um, one of these sites does have an urban heat island, and that's the red one, and that's Heathrow Airport. So around the periphery of London, temperatures are getting slightly warmer than they should be in terms of the average across the whole of the southeast of England. And that's just because of development around the peripheries of London. But there's been no more development in the centre of London 
since 1900. I'll now move on to some sort of cryospheric evidence uh, about glaciers, permafrost, and Arctic sea ice. Um, so the first one is in terms of glaciers. And what we're looking at here is the contribution from those glaciers to sea level rise. So you've got here in terms of millimetres um, over the course of the last 50 years or so. Now if you look at the European area up here, there's very little contribution from the European Alps or Scandinavia to sea level rise. That's because there's hardly any glaciers there, there's hardly any ice. The, some of the, uh, the glaciers are retreating in the Alps, but not in Scandinavia. Um, but if you go to areas with many more glaciers, like sort of northwestern North America and Alaska, then you can see this contribution coming from these ice sheet, these uh, glaciers to sea level rise. So you've got more glaciers here, you've got more contribution. Another uh, area that's been measured a lot is the area of seasonally frozen ground. So this is, you know there's permafrost in large parts of Russia, but there are areas around that which freeze, over, freeze in winter and then thaw in summer. So this is the seasonally frozen ground. And that's been measured quite well since 1900, and that's reduced by about 7% over the course of the 20th century. And that has led in some parts to, in, in Canada as well, into buildings toppling over because there's no need in parts of eastern Siberia to have proper foundations because you can just put the foundations into the ice. And if you start getting warming at the surface, that, that then thaws and that, that thawing goes down and you'll eventually be below the foundations and then your building will fall over. Um, <coughs> then Arctic sea ice, I mean a lot of the diagrams you see about the the reduced sea ice in summer, in, in September in particular. This is just showing you the trend in Arctic sea ice extent in January. So this is near the, ex the maximum extent, which is about now. Um, so it's, it's decreasing then as well over the last 30 or so years. And another factor is the, this area of Hudson's Bay. Um, it's freezing up again much later. So it used to freeze up by about uh, in November and now it's not freezing up till about, till about January. And also over here, around the Zemlia, it's not freezing so, rap so, so, so readily every winter. And these two areas here and here <coughs> might have a big impact on the, the jet stream and our weather in winter. And it may be this, lack, this late freezing of Hudson's Bay or late freezing around northern Russia, which might be the reason for why we're having some unusual varieties of winters recently in terms of uh, much colder ones and then this recent warmer one. Um, I've got some things here about some various trends of temperature. Um, now where to start here? Um, so we have this long series in Britain, centering in temperatures which goes back to 1659. 2010 it was a very cold year. It was the 98th coldest year. It was 2 degrees Celsius in 2010, cooler than 2006, which was the warmest year. But that was still 2 degrees warmer than the coldest year in 1740. Um, and 2010 was the coldest year since 1986. Um, the 2011 was the second warmest year. Only 2006 was warmer. Um, in terms of global averages, um, you can't really do anything about what happens here and, and say that's the global average. 2010 was very cold here, but it was very warm, average over the world. 2011 was very warm in the UK, but it was the second coldest year of this millennium uh, globally. Um, this recent decade, ending in 2010, was 0.43 degrees Celsius warmer than the 1961 to 90 average which was 0.2 warmer than the 1990s. And if you go back, every decade since the 1960s has been warmer than the previous. And the 10 warmest years, even in this new data, uh, are all warmer than every year in the 20th century, apart from 1998. Only 2008 
would drop out if he wanted to pick the 10 warmest years. Is that UK? Or this is global. Yeah, the, the, <coughs> yeah, the gold ones are global here. <coughs> Do you remember last year we had our warmest ever spring? And the autumn was the second warmest. So this was why the year was so warm. Even though the summer was very poor. We had it at different ends of the ends. We had a very warm Easter. We had a, the warmest ever October day. And uh, yesterday we had the warmest ever March day in, in, um, in Scotland. But maybe we'll get the warmest ever March day tomorrow here. Um, I don't know if you've also watching the recent uh, weather records in the, in the US and southern Canada or eastern Canada. They've had an exceptionally warm weather over the last two or three weeks in the eastern US and eastern Canada. It's been exceptionally cold further west in, in North America, though. So it's been record snowfall in Seattle and Portland. But several cities in eastern Canada had their warmest ever March day about, two, about three days ago. And it wasn't just the warmest ever March day, it was the warmest ever April day as well. So it's been amazing records in, in around the Great Lakes area. But in terms of, that's, that's really just weather. So in terms of climate, we're really looking, in terms of climate change, at annual averages and decadal averages because of these, uh, this changeover between El Nino and La Nino events. You've got a lot of variability from year to year, and you're looking for relatively small changes in terms of uh, tenths of a degree between, between decades. What you should be looking at is this running decadal average and not at the individual years. Um, but more important for, uh, for us here in Britain is that we've had these record extremes recently for rainfall. Uh, last spring was the driest ever in central and eastern, eastern England, and it was the fourth driest autumn for central and eastern England. At the same time, it was near record rainfall totals in Scotland. Um, the annual total for central England and eastern England was only 444 millimetres. This is the second dry since 1873. Uh, 1921 was slightly lower. But the, the difference now between what we, where we are now and 20, 1921 is that the temperature is a lot higher. And so the higher temperatures mean that you have uh, these rainfall deficits have a greater effect than they would have done sort of 80, 90 years ago. And much of eastern and southeast England is supplied by groundwater. The recharge of these aquifers only really takes place between November and March. It could chuck it down in May, and that water is not going to get into the aquifers. So this problem that the water companies are, are, are aware of at the moment is not... They've introduced the host pipe banks to try and cut back usage, but they know it might rain a lot, but that might just alleviate issues uh, during the summer, but they're really worried about another dry winter because then the reservoirs and the aquifers will be markedly lower for the start for this time in 2013. Now, projections for the UK. Bob talked about these, and they're on this website. And I'm going to present them a little differently from Bob. Maybe I'll test you to see whether you spotted the difference. Um, the projections are given as probability distribution functions, or PDFs, and they're expressed in this diagram as 10% unlikely to be less than, 50% was his central estimate, and 90% unlikely to be more than. So you've got these three percentile levels. And they're given by different areas. They're given by, um, on this grid basis across the, across the UK. They're given by uh, our, our sort of normal UK type regions, administrative regions. They're given by water authority regions. And there's also projections for the seas around our coasts. And they're given for overlapping 30-year periods into the future, from the 2020s, which is 2010 to 39, through to the 2080s, which is 2070 to 99. So you can get projections now for years which we're currently having. So you can look at this decade, this 30-year period in that one as well. And they're all done with respect to this period 1961 to 90. Now, you'd be surprised that despite improvements in data access and availability, this period is still the best period for surface data around the world. 
we have a lot of satellite data now from the 1980s, but in terms of the amount of data that we took and we digitized, this is still the best period. We're not digitizing so much data in real time as we, as we were then. Now, this is Bob, Bob showed this diagram. Um, so you've got winter at the top here and summer at the bottom. I'll just concentrate on one of them. So this is the mid, sort of the best guess type idea for summer. And you're talking about temperatures by the 2080s, this is for, of about four, five, or six degrees Celsius warmer than average. Now, Bob did this in terms of you could be as bad as this one or, or not as bad as this one. The other way of looking at it is what, how we intended it to be in the report was that it's, it's to bringing in the sort of amount of variability we have from summer to summer and winter to winter. So on average, the summers will be this much warmer by the 2080s. But one in, one in 10 summers, that's what the 90th percentile level means, might be this warm. But one in 10 summers, even then, might only be this warm. Not that the average will be that warm, but there will still be this variability that we currently have between warm summers and cold summers. And you can do this then for the, what we really should be doing is doing similar plots for the 2010 to 39 period and showing that in this same way to see whether, uh, to see where current summers actually fit. And this is just the mean temperatures. You can also do this for the, for the daytime temperatures during summer and the warmest days in summer as well. Um, <coughs> this is the daily maximum temperature in summer, and then these are the, the uh, values for each administrative region here in terms of... So what this is saying, if you're in eastern England, by the 2080s, you'd be 4.8 degrees Celsius warmer for daily daytime temperatures in summer. There might be a summer that's only 2.1 warmer, but there might be on 1 in 10 times a summer that's 8.4 warmer. Now, it, it's how to use these. Um, so Bob glossed over this. Um, but what, this, what these projections are providing is future weather. But for 30-year time slices, and because we, they're not really future weather, not down to the specific day. We're providing, they're not forecasts, we're providing a, a hundred different possibilities of those, those 30 years, taking into account all the uncertainties in the modeling that the Hadley Center have produced. And so how they should be used is in a probabilistic way. So how you, you select a region, you select an emission scenario, and you produce a hundred sets of these future weather using this built-in weather generator which is the bit we did in, in, in Norwich. Then, for each sector, you have some uh, way now that you assess your vulnerability to current weather. So you have a model. So one example is that you have a, a crop climate model. So you've got a model that models wheat, a wheat plant, or you can do it for sugar beet. We've done it, uh, we even got someone working in our, in our uh, group, in the next building to us, doing it on purple sprouting broccoli. So you've got a model of that plant, and you can then give that model a, um, the weather during the summer in terms of rainfall and temperature and a few other variables, and then you can produce the yield of that particular crop. And then you put through the 100 sequences, and you build up a distribution of the potential impact. And then you know, uh, in terms of a yield, then you can work out a PDF to say what, what the possible impacts might be. So we're doing this with, with crop yields, we're doing it with, with the water industry, we're working with southern water and also Anglian water, and we're also doing it with a number of, of uh, uh, building uh, uh, development companies uh, and, ar and architects, because they also have uh, models of new blocks of flats, uh, new industrial complexes, to see how well those, those buildings work with future weather, to see how soon they might need to retrofit um, air conditioning schemes or how often they're going to fail. So this is how they should be used, 
by taking these future sequences, putting them through a known uh, model of that particular sector. So some sectors haven't got models yet, but some, the water industry has always had them, and the building industry has them, the agricultural industry has them, and they can be used this way. And I'm sure the health area could also use them in this way. So in conclusions, um, a new data set for global temperatures warms by a similar amount to the older version. There's nothing really new there. If we didn't correct the sea surface temperatures, they would be much greater warming, and they would be then be at odds with the land temperatures. Uh, the recent changes are very dependent on, on the length, the period you choose, and on the occurrence of El Nino events when they occur. The big period for an El Nino event is about now in the March, April, May time. That's when the switchover tends to occur in the tropical Pacific. So there's an awful lot of people looking at the moment to see whether we're going to move from our current La Nina event, whether we're going to switch to an El Nino event, whether we're going to go to some more neutral event, or whether we're going to stick with the La Nina. Once you've got past the end of May, you can then make a prediction round to the next March. But you can't get through that March, April, May period which is referred to as the predictability barrier for El Nino events. Uh, most alpine glaciers are retreating. Permafrost is reducing, and Arctic sea ice is also reducing. It's not going year on year, because a lot of, some of these changes are related to, the, to differences in the weather from year to year. But if you look at them on the decadal time scale, they're all uh, reducing. Um, not all glaciers are, are retreating, though. You might hear reports that glaciers in Western Norway are advancing, um, and maybe the South Island of New Zealand. But most glaciers respond to temperatures in summer. If you're in more mid-latitude regions, they tend to, in like Norway and the South Island of New Zealand, the Western Chile, they respond to how much snowfall they get. Um, they do melt a lot, but so what causes them to advance is more, more snow. But the vast majority respond to uh, warmer temperatures or cooler temperatures in, in summer. And so they advance with colder temperatures and uh, uh, to retreat with warmer temperatures. Assessments of future impacts requires impact models of how different sectors respond to past climate variability and change. You need these models of how we were, how we've responded in the past to weather and climate changes. Um, so if you, in a sector that hasn't got these, you've got to develop those first. Future projections for the UK come from these things and, and these should all be, always be considered in this probabilistic framework. So you shouldn't make, say, definitive statements about one particular year. You should use uh, these, these uh, in, the, in this probabilistic way. And I'll stop there, thank you. <laughs>